I'm on the phone today with Mr. David Green, the CEO of Harvard Apparatus Regenerative Technology. Mr. Green, thank you for taking the time to do this interview. James, pleasure to be here. To provide some quick background, Harvard Apparatus was recently spun from Harvard Bioscience, a company that you co-founded and served at as president for 17 years. Right now, Harvard Bioscience's market cap is about $130 million, while Harvard Apparatus is about $40 million. Why did you want to leave Harvard Bioscience, a larger company, to become the CEO of a much smaller company? And should investors see that as an endorsement of the company's prospects? Well, in, in, in short, I'm putting my money where my mouth is, right? Um, I have a big investment in the company. It's, uh, uh, the investment I have in, uh, in heart is uh, by far the biggest single asset in my, uh, in my family's uh, uh, wealth. So uh, I'm very much putting my money where my mouth is. Um, I think the growth prospects for heart are much better than the growth prospects for Harvard Bioscience, and I'm not saying anything negative about Harvard Bioscience. It had a very successful uh, growth period from about um, $10 million in revenue when I joined the company uh, as president in 1996 to last year $112 million in revenue. So there's nothing wrong with that growth story, but it certainly doesn't have the magnitude of growth that Heart has. Heart is creating regenerated organs for transplant. Our first, pro our first product is a regenerated trachea. And even with that product alone, we think it's a hundreds of millions of dollars a year uh, in revenue in uh, annual market size. Right. And a trachea is just the first. We do have other uh, human organs uh, behind the trachea in terms of the pipeline of development. So I really think this is a, a very, very big growth opportunity. And that's ultimately why I decided to resign my position as president of Harvard Bioscience and instead take up the CEO position in heart. How many shares do you uh, beneficially own in Heart? Uh, the, the number I'm not quite sure of. It's easy to express it as a, as a percentage. So I own about 5% of the company in, in shares outright, um, where I just own the shares. It's nothing to do with stock options. Right. And then if all my stock options were uh, vested and exercised, I'd own an additional about 9% of the company. And the Inbreeze Airway Transplant System is currently in trial with, I believe, six patients who have synthetic transplants. How many patients are going to be needed altogether to complete the clinical trial? Uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, correct a couple of the comments you made there. So there are eight patients who received the uh, tracheal transplant product so far, um, and three of those have been in a clinical trial. Okay. Um, so those, those, those are the actual facts. To get, to get through to FDA approval and European Uni Union approval market the product widely, we estimate we need between 20 and 30 patients um, in total. And in the clinical trial, we expect there to be three sites. One will be in Russia, one will be in Western Europe, and one will be in the United States. And uh, we will combine all that data together to have a single clinical trial. Now, although we've made initial contact with the regulatory agencies, both the FDA in the United States and the EMA in the European Union, we do not have any written agreement with them yet as to the exact design of the clinical trial. So what I mentioned are our estimates, um, but until we have a actual written agreement with the regulatory agencies, we can't be certain that those will be the actual numbers of patients in the clinical trial. Okay. There's, I know there's only three patients in the trial right now, but have you seen any complications with any of those recipients? Uh, no major complications so far. In fact, the very first patient uh, who was treated was treated over five years ago now, and she recently passed the, the five-year survival point, and her clinical results were published in a medical journal called The Lancet, which is one of the world's top medical journals, and she, she, she shows an excellent quality of life Throughout that five-year period, uh, she has children, she has a job, she has a family, uh, she has a very, very normal quality of life um, from a condition where she was, uh, she had only a few months to live prior wow. to the surgery. So it seems like everything has been fairly successful so far. Uh, what issues, if any, do you see could potentially threaten or delay approval? 
Well, to threaten an approval at this point, I think you'd have to have something go very badly wrong that we have not seen. Right. Because as I mentioned, we've seen, we have eight patients. The longest is at five years. The second longest is over two years now. Uh, and there are several patients in the one-year range. And remember, these patients are all compassionate use cases, which means they, they're very sick and they have uh, all other types of therapy. And uh, it's only because of that that we're allowed to treat them um, under these compassionate use regulations. So these patients are very sick in the first place, and yet so far we've got excellent clinical trial results. So it would really take something very different to what we've already seen to threaten an approval. Uh, that answers your first question. For your second question, delay. Uh, delay could come from a number of sources. Um, it could be that the FDA or the EMA requires a, a much larger number of patients than we're estimating. That would be one source of delay. Um, or there's some complication in the clinical trial where the FDA puts the trial on hold for a while and uh, makes you wait a certain period before you go back to recruiting patients. So I think there's probably more risk that something surprises us and it delays the trial than something surprises us and it actually terminates the trial for some reason. Okay, and then that segues well into, and you can correct me here if I'm wrong, but Harvard Apparatus was spun off with $15 million in cash, and I read you right. also received um, two $5 million grants from Russian and European authorities. Do you believe that that's enough capital to get the inbreathe, inbreathe system into commercialization? Um, no, not really. I want to clarify something there, James. Um, the two grants for $5 million each are not actually to the company. They're to the hospitals that are running the clinical trials. So what they really do is they fund the clinical trials. Right. Um, so that removes cost we would otherwise have to spend, but it doesn't actually come to the company. We do not, we do not have the cash from either of those two grants. So the capital that the company has today is about $15 million, and uh, we've said publicly that we do not expect that to be sufficient for us to uh, reach cash flow positive from the sale of these products, and we expect to have some kind of capital raise at some point in the future. Is there any way that you could reasonably estimate how much capital you may need? Uh, well, I can't actually answer that question directly. I'm afraid my lawyers would probably shoot me <laughs> if, I, if I did that. But I can give you some um, some pointers to uh, towards that. Uh, uh, the first our actual burn rate. So uh, in uh, our, our current annual burn is about seven and between seven and eight million dollars per year. Okay. So $15 million is roughly two, two years worth of capital at our current burn rate. Um, that's one thing to, uh, to look at. Uh, the second thing to look at is that uh, we do have some revenue. It's not very much revenue, and I, and I don't want to kid anyone that it's enough to cover all of our costs. But we do make the uh, bioreactor com components of our in-breath uh, tracheal transplant system for research. Uh, there's a, a very active research community um, doing experiments on uh, both uh, trachea regeneration and other organ regeneration, and we do sell those products. Uh, and that's an opportunity that could be several million dollars a year. And then the final thing is um, we do have opportunities to uh, partner elements of our uh, pipeline, mm -hmm. and uh, we may pursue some of those things that we're bring in cash from the outside that wouldn't necessarily be cash sourced from uh, shareholders. So some combination of those of um, uh, sale of shares of the company plus revenue plus um, uh, partnership agreements will probably be the sources of cash for the company over the next few years. Okay. I want to try to understand what your sales cycle will look like once the system is approved. Is the bioreactor only used once per procedure, or will the company be selling scaffolds to medical teams that already purchased the bioreactor? Uh, the bioreactor and the scaffold are sold as a single unit, Okay. and uh, they can only be used once. Okay. So we, we expect to be paid per procedure, and our revenue estimate is $100,000 per procedure for the combination of the scaffold the bioreactor and the intellectual property associated with um, creating the seeded scaffold. And will your company be assisting physicians with it, or is there much of a learning curve to using the system? Um, so far.
far, we have had um, people from our company present at at uh, all of the surgeries other than the very first one, um, which we actually had uh, no part in. But uh, for all subsequent surgeries, uh, there have been uh, heart personnel present at uh, at the surgeries. And why might you think the medical field would possibly hesitate to adopt this technology? Um, well, I don't think they will because the patients who we're treating have no other options. Right. So it's not like we're introducing the fifth statin to a market that is already crowded with um, you know, other statins, you know, cholesterol-lowering drugs. Mm -hmm. In this case, trachea cancer, which is one of the two main indications we're going after with uh, the trachea replacement product, trachea cancer has median survival of only 10 months from diagnosis. So current treatments like chemotherapy and radiation therapy um, fail to stop trachea cancer from killing the patient. Um, and so um, this is a uh, very high value added treatment for the patient. It is a life-saving therapy for the patients. And so um, I think we're very well positioned to get the kind of investment for our products that I described. And that said, there aren't any real competitors either working on similar systems, are there? That's right. Um, we are the only people who do this synthetic scaffold uh, approach to uh, the regeneration and transplant of, of tracheas. And I think uh, since we are the first, uh, the very first trachea, regenerated trachea transplant surgery was done with in-breath technology. That was in 2008. The first one with a synthetic scaffold was done with in-breath technology. That was in 2011. Um, and the last four uh, tracheal transplants have all been done using our complete system of the bioreactor and the scaffold. So we're the first, and that really matters when you're in uh, medical device markets with novel therapies. Secondly, we do have issued patents already on our bioreactors. And thirdly, we intend to apply for orphan designation in both the United States and in Europe. And orphan designation in the U.S. gives you a seven-year government monopoly and in Europe, it gives you a 10-year government monopoly. And those are in addition to any protection you get under the patents. And as a small company, do you face any challenges in terms of distribution? Uh, not really, because uh, trachea cancer and even trachea stenosis, which is a narrowing of the trachea, usually caused by some kind of injury, um, both those conditions are fairly small clinical conditions. We estimate the total patient population to be about 6,000 patients per year. And those patients are all going to get treated in a relatively small number of major hospitals. This is not something that's going to be done in every hospital. Right. So we can probably cover the entire world um, with a very small number of salespeople. Um, so we do not need to have a thousand person field sales force like you might have to have for a, a new drug or something. Right, that's a good point. Um, you also mentioned how you're working on lungs, GI tracts, heart valves, hearts. Is it realistic to think that we could see those organs being transplanted in, in the next five to ten years? Uh, I hesitate to put a time on it because it's very difficult to predict when this will become real. But I do think it is real that lungs will be regenerated and transplanted. I also think eventually you will see hearts regenerated and transplanted. But I don't want to kid people this is coming anytime soon. Right. Uh, lung regeneration and transplant has been accomplished in rats. Uh, it was actually done at Massachusetts General Hospital here in Boston and done with one of our leading collaborators, a surgeon called Dr. Harold Ott at MGH. So it's not like this is science fiction. Animal work has been done that shows that it can be done, but I do think it's quite a way to translate that to human surgeries. Um, heart uh, uh, regeneration has been done, but it has not been transplanted into any animals yet, so I think that is further out than lung. On the esophagus, though, um, uh, the esophagus is closer to uh, reaching a first in human than either lung or heart. Esophagus is the other tube that goes down from your mouth. It goes down the back of your throat, down to your stomach, rather than the front of your throat, down to your lungs, which is where the trachea is. But like the trachea, it is a hollow tube. And we're collaborating with several different um, leading academic medical centers around the world 
to uh, to create regenerated esophagus for transplant. It's not been done yet, um, but uh, I do think that is the most likely one to come next after trachea. That's all the questions I have for you. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about the company that investors should know or, or may have overlooked? Well, I think that was a pretty comprehensive grilling, James. <laughs> those, were, uh, those were pretty good questions. I think you, you really highlighted the most important ones, whether it was sort of uh, cash flow and, and capital generation on the one hand, the success of the patients, the eight patients so far, and then the, the prospects for the future with esophagus, lung, and heart. I think you really covered most of the bases there. Okay, great. And uh, again, I want to thank you for your time, and I appreciate the insight. Uh, no problem, James. I look forward to uh, chatting further.